Father, it is such a gift to sing about Jesus. It's such a gift to gather as your people for worship, to know and be known by you, to love you and to live from your love, Lord, that you have so lavishly, generously poured out upon us. God, my prayer this morning is that you would cause our love to abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that we as a body may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Let me encourage you to stay uh, standing for the reading of God's word as we come to Luke chapter six. And if you're new with us this morning, we have the verses on the screens and so you can follow along there. This is where we're going to be in the word today. Luke chapter six, beginning in verse 27. I'm gonna read all the way down to verse 36 this morning. This is the word of the Lord. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. From one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. May the Lord write its eternal truths on your hearts. You guys can be seated. Good morning. You guys all right? I don't know what it is, but um, I think the combination of the time change, which is a standard, this is like classic, doing this for now 11 years. Um, This happens every time change Sunday. But I think it threw us off that we were about, we moved the services back a half hour, and I think that ruined everything, right? (laughs) because we realize that 8.30 is like the absolute earliest you can do a service and have any reasonable amount of attendance. And so when it's feeling like 7.30, we're all in trouble. But um, you guys have braved the elements and you've made it. Well done. And we're glad that you're here. If you have your Bibles, why don't you go to Luke 6? I, I, I'm planning to just get into it just like every other Sunday. And uh, I, I just take it that you guys are, are early birds and uh, you're here to get after it. So uh, Luke chapter six is where we're going to be. My name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor here. If you're new with us, <laughs> which I bet all the volunteer, the, all the new people are here at 1030, but on the off chance that you're new with us, right? You have a friend that's just really zealous for the Lord comes at 830 and is dragging you here. We are so glad that you're here. Okay. And, uh, I mean, it'd be my joy to meet you after the service. If, if that's something you want to do, I usually hang out in the lobby by the windows. Um, but otherwise, come and be blessed as we sing about Jesus, as we talk about Jesus, as our entire series is about looking to Jesus. There's nothing more important that I would want to give away to you than giving you a glimpse of Jesus. And so hopefully we get to do that today. Title of the message this morning is Like Father, Like Son. like father, like son. And for those of you who have been following along with us as we've been going through the book of Luke, we've been going verse by verse, and now we've arrived at the second section, right, of 
the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus' most famous sermon. And, and, and let me just get it out right away because sometimes the way we read this is the Sermon on the Mount becomes a list of ethical duties that we read as if we need to do these in order to merit entrance into the kingdom. We see these and we think this is what we have to do to achieve salvation, but that's not at all the intent of what's going on here. These aren't ethical duties to be received by us as that stuff we have to do to achieve uh, salvation, but rather pronouncements of the kind of conduct and character that defines those who are already kingdom bound, right? It's the conduct and character of the kingdom constituents, if you will, which would be any believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Any Christian is a kingdom-bound individual. And so today, what Jesus is going to do is he's going to talk about how do kingdom constituents like you and me, Christian, respond when we're now saved, when Jesus Christ becomes Lord and we're thrust back into a world antagonistic to Christ and antagonistic to his kingdom. How ought we to respond? And you think about it and you're like, man, talk about God's word being timeless. Is it not now, maybe more than ever in our lifetime, that we're really thrust into a world antagonistic to Jesus more than ever in anyone's life? And figuring out how do we operate within that? What are we supposed to do? What is the answer to how we're supposed to respond in a world antagonistic to Jesus? How are we supposed to overcome the evil and the hate and the hostility that comes towards those who follow Jesus? Well, Jesus' answer is actually quite simple. The way he wants you to respond is like God, your father. And in fact, this is the big idea for this morning. It's really, really simple today. Kingdom actions reveal kingdom origins. Kingdom actions don't birth kingdom origins. Kingdom actions reveal kingdom origins. That is, kingdom constituents, Christians, are to do or be like what is revealed in this text because this is what their father is like. Christian, this is what your father is like. And true sons bear resemblance to their fathers. Which, by the way, is a high bar, isn't it? I've been thinking all week, I've actually been singing the song. Do you remember the 90s commercial, the Gatorade commercial, where uh, Be Like Mike? You remember that? And it's like footage of Michael Jordan doing the like, you know, tongue out, like behind the, you know, back and then brings it up and slams it. And then it, it, it cuts to a scene of a child trying to do the same thing, right? And in a sense, it's kind of a cool picture of how we are. It's like the Lord is kind of like, you know, that untouchable can't get there, won't ever be as good as Jordan, of course, par excellence, way different. But then we're like the kids, right? That attempt the, ah, with the dunk and the whole thing. And, uh, but if we're not careful, what we can do is just equate the two. Oh, just like it's like to be like Mike, we'll just copy it in our own strength, but Christianity doesn't work that way. You don't just be like your father in your own strength. Otherwise, what you'll start to develop is a kind of box-checking Christianity. So when we say to imitate our father, what we need to understand is in order to imitate our father, we need the son's power in us. And in fact, that's the foundation. Even if you go back to Luke chapter 6, verse 19, remember when he was talking about all this power coming from and through Jesus to others. That in other words, if we are to bear the kind of kingdom fruit that we ought to bear, we need to be transformed by the power of the Son to bear the distinctive marks of the Father. And so, yes, we imitate the Father, and yes, it falls short, but to truly resemble the Father, we need the empowerment and the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Son, who died and rose for us. And so what is that? Now, having been transformed, assuming the gospel in us, what is that distinctive mark of the Father that should also be the distinctive mark of his sons. Well, I think it's pretty clear in the text today that it's the love of enemies. This is how we're to overcome the evil 
the hostility, the hatred in the world, you are to love your enemies. Because listen, this is what God does. Let me make it more personal. This is what God has done with you. You were once an enemy and he lavished his love upon you. And when you're changed by that love, you will bear that love to a world hostile to Christ and his kingdom. So we're gonna see it in four parts today. Kingdom love. When you, when you think kingdom love, think love of enemies, okay? Kingdom love, love of enemies. Kingdom love, love of enemies, okay? Kingdom love in four parts today. Kingdom love in action, Kingdom loves reaction, kingdom loves rule, and kingdom loves reward. That's where we're going, because that's where the text goes. It's amazing. My outlines, exactly how the Bible lays it out. All right. Number one, kingdom love in action. What does it look like to proactively pursue what Jesus is talking about. Well, he opens up, verse 27. But I say, listen to this, to you who hear, right? Remember, Jesus is speaking to a large audience, right? It's a mixed multitude of people. And we talked about who was in this audience. The people in Jesus' audience are the people that come to church every single week at Doxa Church. It was a mixture of committed disciples, less committed disciples, those who were curious and those who were trying to catch Jesus and saying something that they could get on him for, right? The committed, the less committed, the curious, and the catch him. That was everybody that was there. And it's this huge group. And Jesus is speaking specifically to, he knows he's speaking to more than can hear him and respond to his word. And so he's speaking specifically, understanding that there's a difference between you hearing and you hearing like Jesus is talking about that you have a spiritual understanding, right? He would be speaking, by the way, those who have a spiritual understanding, wouldn't that be from last week, those who have an understanding that they're poor in spirit? Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who mourn their sin and their state into repentance, and those who rejoice when they're reviled on account of the Lord Jesus, wouldn't those be the ones who have spiritual understanding? He is speaking to those who can hear and respond to what he is saying. And again, the question is, how do we respond to, how do we overcome it's a big piece of today. How do we overcome all the hate and all the evil that Jesus promised would come his disciples' way? He didn't leave us without awareness. He promised hate was coming our way. Here's the answer, by love. Now he describes love because love for us so often is feely, isn't it? I feel something towards you and he's like, I'm not letting you do it. I'm not letting you leave love in the feels category. I'm gonna bring it into a holistic definition and so he gives us really four commands that speak of really one reality, love your enemies. But he gives it to us by attitude, action, speech, and petition. Here's what it looks like to love your enemies. They're all speaking of the same thing. These aren't just describing what it looks like to love your enemies. Let me be clear. It is commanding you, kingdom constituent, to do these things. Love your enemies enemies and attitude, action, speech, and petition. And attitude, let's at least start there. He says, love your enemies. Now, what's interesting is the parallel passage in Matthew 5.43 says, Jesus says it like this, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Wait a minute. Pause on that for a second. Did you hear me? You guys, this multitude of the people at the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, where did they get that in the Old Testament? The answer is they didn't get it in the Old Testament. The answer is they had been following the interpretation of the Pharisees and the scribes who had started to interpret loving your neighbor in a very rigid kind of way. They interpreted loving your neighbor, they truncated the idea of neighbor down to fellow Jew, and they elevated the expectation of love to be not just that you had to love your neighbor, i.e. fellow Jew, but in order to love your fellow Jew, you had to hate the outside Gentile. 
to the point where there's actually a Pharisee maxim that would go around town. The idea of you see a Gentile fallen in the sea, don't lift him out. Even amongst the Romans who had control of the area, the Jews were known as those who hated the human race because they truncated down through a bad interpretation the intention of loving your neighbors as yourself and expanded that to mean hating your enemies. And so Jesus is recovering really the Old Testament intent of love, which ought to be a self-sacrificial kind of love for your neighbor not truncated down to the fellow Jew because he'll continue on. You love your enemies, he says. Now, what does that look like in action? Well, he gives it to us. Do good to those who hate you. So love has action going on here. You are to proactively seek the well-being of those who hate you. Now, again, if you were following the Old Testament and you didn't let the Pharisees' interpretation sort of shift your view of the Old Testament, you would understand this is nothing new. Proverbs 25, 21, and 22 gives a physical example of this when it talks about, listen, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. This would be proactively seeking someone's physical well-being. But obviously, this would mean seeking someone's spiritual well-being as well. You would want to be proactively engaged in seeking someone who hates you, seeking their spiritual well-being. Now, let me just give you a, a practical context where I could see this playing out in somebody's life would be you're entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. could be someone close to you, family or a close friend, someone that you can't really get away from in relationship that has hurt you so bad, even though you have this close proximity relationship and opportunity to share the gospel, you withhold the gospel because in a sense, you're almost concluding out of your own hurt that they don't deserve the gospel that you're proclaiming. Okay, I know that's possible because I've lived that myself. And, and this would challenge kingdom constituents to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. The way you respond to that kind of hatred towards you is not to withhold physical good or spiritual good, but actually to do good to those who hate you. And not just to do good to those who hate you, but actually to speak good to those who hate you. It says, then now speech-wise, you are to bless those who curse you. It's not the same word as last week. Remember when we got bless, blessed are the poor, blessed are the right hungry. It's not the same word for bless. This is a different word. The idea here is when someone speaks misfortune or evil over you, you respond by speaking or seeking from God their blessing. All of these go very much hand in hand. In fact, one of the ways you would obviously seek God is by praying for these people, which is in fact what happens here. So speech turns into petition. When someone curses you and wishes evil and misfortune on you, you bring that person before the Lord in prayer. This is what kingdom constituents do. And I bet if we thought about it, we could think of an example of the Lord Jesus. When he was nailed on that cross, what did he do in modeling this for us? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Listen, kingdom love is possible, but it's only possible when it's empowered by the Savior who dwells in us by his spirit. And we see that example in Stephen when he's martyred in the book of Acts. Do you remember this? He stunningly models Jesus in a profound way, saying something awfully close. When he is stoned, he says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Guys, that's a disciple walking in the same strength and power of the Lord Jesus, proving his kingdom constituency because kingdom actions reveal kingdom origins. Now, let me just for the sake of application kind of give you the reality of what is true in the world, okay? There's, there's only three options to respond to evil, misfortune, hatred. There's only three responses. What hurts them, what benefits me, or what glorifies God. That is it. 
Okay, so you're going to respond to evil in some way. You only have three options. You're, you're going to respond to evil and misfortune this week, and you have three options. I can respond with what hurts you. I can respond with what benefits me. Or I can respond like God and glorify him. That's it. So let me, let me just give you a sense for what I mean there, right? We're all going to respond in some way. If you respond by, I'm going to get you back for getting me. Here's what you're playing into. This is proving that evil is contagious. When evil is done to you, it permeates you and you respond with evil back. The danger with that, not only that it's contagious, not only that it infiltrates us, that evil, but it elevates to something terrible. You think about how you respond to evil by pushing back, right? You push me, I'll punch you. You hate me, I'll kill you. Do you see the elevation? Evil, responding to evil with evil elevates all the way to destruction. And that is a path many have taken. That is an option. Practically speaking, that is one of the ways, one of the most common ways the world responds. The issue with that, though, is that the hatred doesn't stop in that circumstance. It only stops when it's absorbed and overcome by love. This is what Jesus is trying to say. Here's the second way. Okay, fine. I'm not going to go the way of saying, um, you hit me, I'll hit you back harder. I'll go after what hurts you. This time, I know I'm just going to mind my own business and do what benefits me. That's what the kind of religious ethic is of the day. It's even what I would call the kind of secular neutral ethic. And of course, we don't believe there's anything neutral in our world, right? It's either Christ or it's chaos. But there's this kind of mentality of like, okay, let me, I'm just going to protect my own and take care of myself and do what's in the best interest of me. And the problem with that is it falls short of that which would bring glory and recognition and believability to the gospel of the kingdom. Because in the end, what has... What is that at its core but self-interest and self-focus and you're motivated by self and in the end, that's destructive as well. And so you're only left with one option. When presented with evil, I could hurt you. When presented with evil, I could focus on myself or when presented with evil, I could choose to glorify God. And when you love in response, it more than neutralizes the evildoer it actually overcomes the evildoer. And even maybe being presented with this kind of love is so confounded by it that it becomes one of the stepping stones towards their transformation in the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's so clearly countercultural. It is so clearly, this is not how the world works. The world works in plan A and plan B. I get you back when you get me or I worry about myself. That's the world. When they see us living like our Father in heaven, that's a witness to the world that there is another kingdom that is infiltrating this world. Jesus lays this out. That's how you love in action. But what about those times that it's reactive? What about those times when you're presented in a scenario, you need to know how to respond right away, right? You've been there before. You're, you're thrust into a circumstance. How do I respond in kingdom love? And that's the second point. Kingdom loves reactions. He gives four illustrations of responding when the world initiates. So when the world pushes you and you're not prepared for it, this isn't you being proactive. This is you being reactive. What do you do? This is when you're not ready, when you go to work on Monday and you're like, oh, I didn't know this was coming. How do you respond? Jesus gives four examples. Let's start with the cheek. This is such a religiously famous text, isn't it? To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. Okay, I, I just need to be really clear. This context is so important, okay? This gets butchered all the time. Christians are notorious for making an error with this text. The context isn't you're in a dangerous situation being robbed at gunpoint, protecting your children, and you're like, what Jesus would want me to do is just lay over right now. Just be pummeled to the glory of God. Because that's what it says. 
Give him your cheek. Might as well give him my children too. No. This is about dishonor. This is about being dishonored. This is about being humiliated. This is really the idea of being disfellowshipped. If you, if you were to become a Christian, you would be desynagogued. You wouldn't be welcomed back into the synagogue. And one of the ways they would express their dislike for you and your choice to humiliate you is that they would slap you. It's a sign of shame. And Jesus says the way you overcome that evil is by accepting the second slap instead of giving one. Now, why? why? Why is that the way to go forward? Because love won't be shamed into stopping. Love reverses the shame. When you're slapped once, that's a man showing he's in control and pushing you out of the synagogue. When you turn to be slapped twice, that's a man showing he's cruel. That's a bully being outed for who he really is. You're no longer a victim in the circumstance just being walked all over. You have actually turned the tables because now as you turn to the other cheek, which is beyond what the expectation would be for a situation like that, he has to decide, will I reveal who I really am and act cruel towards you? And so in a way, what you begin to see is this is actually love convicting someone of the evil that's in their own hearts. You call them to the mat. You actually, in a sense, expose what's inside of them. Love isn't just affirming, as we like to think in our culture today. Love is actually exposing. Love is outing. Love convicts. And we see the same thing in the next example. He says, and one from one who takes away your cloak, which would be like your outer garment, do not withhold your tunic, which would be like your t-shirt closest to your body either. It's like this. If the robber tries to come off generous and steals your outside cloak, but not your inside cloak, going, hey, this is a pretty good deal. I know I'm robbing you, but I've left you your shirt. You go, oh, no, 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 take my shirt as well. Because in so doing, what happens is you outdo his so-called generosity with your own. Look at how generous he's being. He left you a tunic. Take the tunic as well. That extra step beyond exposes their evil and you end up fighting that offense with well-doing. That's the point. It's an actual and amazing reverse. Jesus isn't just saying, yep, let everyone walk all over you and get pummeled. He's saying, expose their evil by calling them to the mat on their own actions. They're trying to come off with some sort of pious nobility. Look what they're doing. And they're like, no, you can take my shirt as well. And to the one who begs from you, he says, to give. That's the third illustration. Now, it seems like a general saying, but this parallel in Matthew 5.42 shows that there's a connection here to the Mosaic regulations behind lending money with an interest charge. And so you don't need to know all this, but you would see this in Exodus 22, 25 and Leviticus 25, 36 and 37. But the basic rule was, I give so you give. So people gave to those who were worthy. People gave to those who could reciprocate. We're going to talk about this. This is the comparison Jesus is going to make. The sinners, this category, engages in a love of reciprocity. But the kingdom constituents, the Christians, they don't worry about a love of reciprocity because the only reciprocity that matters to them is that the Lord rewards them abundantly for responding in a kingdom way. It's what you see in verse 35. You have to do these things 
expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great. I'm not worried about reciprocity when I know my reward is coming from my father who's in heaven. If I go in now and decide to go reciprocity right here, I lose my reward in heaven. You can have it. You can have it now or you can love like a kingdom constituent would and receive from your father who is in heaven. And finally, he says, and to the thief, he speaks of the one who takes away your goods, he says, do not demand them back. All right. We got to do a little bit of work here. This is the classic, I, I hear this, I've heard this so many times over the years. This is the classic defense for why Christians should be doormats that people walk all over. You ever heard someone say that? We're just doormats and everyone's just supposed to walk all over us if we're really being um, like Jesus wants us to be. And I, I gotta get you to see this and so I'm gonna pound this really hard right now. This is not a defense for Christians are just doormats to walk all over. Actually, what Jesus is saying here is intended to be a form of resistance. You are not to just let evil come all over you passively and do nothing. You are actually to resist evil by doing good. That's the way to see it. He goes, I want you to resist, but don't do it like the zealots do it. When they hit you, you resist by hitting them back. Don't do that. And don't be passive either like helpless victims supposed to just take it and grudgingly bear it. That's not kingdom righteousness either. He says, you're supposed to resist, guys, by what will actually triumph over evil. There's only one thing that will actually triumph over evil. I know it feels good to sock the guy back, but you just get drawn into that evil. And so Jesus is not saying just passively take it. He's saying resist evil and overcome it the only way it's overcome. Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Love is your weapon for this, guys. Love is a weapon. You go, well, what happens if it looks like I'm taken advantage of? You still don't lose. Why? Because God outgives whatever you give up. Number one. And number two, God delivers you from internal enslavement to hate of others, to self-centeredness, and to worldliness. You don't lose. Love is a weapon. We're not pacifists. Resist evil by loving your enemy. Overcome evil with good. That's the point. We don't lose when we do that and we glorify our Father who is in heaven. Now, let's talk details. Kingdom rule or rules. Kingdom loves rule, right? We gotta get to Bambi at some point. That's where we all learn this anyway. Now again, we're hitting verse 31. We know verse 31 is the... We doing all right? Shoot one of these. How are we doing out there? Are we okay? I don't want you to get too tired. Am I teaching too much? And you're just like. <laughs> okay, welcome back. Hi, everyone. I found at times it's helpful to do that because it does draw everyone back in. We're going to talk about the golden rule. And um, we need to make sure we understand the golden rule because here's what we've gotten so far. Here's the framework that Jesus is laying out. Responding how you've been treated, that's how the world does it. You respond in reaction to how you've been treated. Responding the way you want to be treated, that's how kingdom constituents do it. Very, very different. People tend to think the golden rule is like a universal religious rule. Everybody believes this rule. But if you actually look about, at how the golden rule is used in other religious contexts, you realize something very different about it. But if you're not listening with a critical ear, you can, like, um, you can miss what's going on. So let me give you an example of how the so-called golden rule was used by Confucius. Okay? 
Here's what Confucius said. What you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others. An undiscerning Christian goes, sounds like the same thing. But is it the same thing? You should not do to others or what you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others. Is that the same thing? Here's the difference, guys. In the case of Confucius's statement, that statement is about self-protection in the end. It's not the same thing. The idea there is, I don't want people to treat me poorly so I won't treat others poorly. Who's at the center of that? You are. That is not the golden rule. The golden rule is, I'm going to love you in the way I would like you to love me, period. Not this sort of, I don't want to treat someone poorly because I might get that back myself. That puts me at the center. The golden rule puts the glory of God at the center. And he draws out the standard, this difference between the standard or rule of the world and the standard or rule of kingdom constituents. And he breaks this down by drawing out this series of contrasts between the sinner's standard or rule of love and Jesus' standard or rule of love. Now, when he uses the word sinners here, by the way, what's interesting is he's throwing the Pharisees in there, which is awesome. But you need to understand for our context, sinner means unbeliever, sinner means outside of the kingdom. There's a rule of love for those who are unbelievers, those who are outside of the kingdom, and then there are rules for those inside the kingdom. And so he breaks it down in verse 32. He says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. Same thing in verse 33. If you do good to those who do good to you, same idea, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get the same amount. So what's going on here? Sinners have a certain kind of love. If you wanted to name it, put simply, this is a love of reciprocity. The world's system of love is a love of reciprocity. I give to get. This is the standard for sinners. This is the standard for those outside of the kingdom. I give to get. I act for my own self-interest as numero uno. So I'm not giving to you if you can't give back to me. If you can't give back to me, you're not a worthy recipient to give to. Of course, we know that's not how the Lord deals with us. Praise the Lord. Could you imagine if the Lord only gave to those who were worthy? We'd all be dead. Did someone say that? We'd all be dead. Word, we'd all be dead. Or, or, or the idea of um, God giving only to those who can give back to him, who can pay him back. Do you see why this is an issue? Because it fundamentally miss, misses the entire gospel. It misses the very foundation of it. This is why it's so interesting that the, world, or the word is, when he says, what benefit is that to you? The word is literally grace. What, what grace is that to you? What favor is that to you? It doesn't bring any favor to you and it doesn't bring any favor through you to respond the way sinners respond. To love like sinners is no different than anything else. But when you act out of goodness, drawn from the wells of gospel grace without considering worthiness or repayment of another, now you're in the category of kingdom, love. Because this is what God does, doesn't he? What he's doing with us is he's going, you need, to, you need to rethink the way you love people. And you need to change your former way of loving, which was a loan system, into a gift system. Like the Lord does. Out of the overflow of his goodness, 
giving to his people who were once his enemies. And when we do that, here's the encouragement, guys. Some of the fruit that comes from this is that when we love in this way, man, it is a massive boost to your own assurance in the faith. When you love like this and you see evidences and fruit of this kind of love, it should just be like sirens going off in your head. I have the life of God in my soul. The only way to explain how I was able to respond like that is because Jesus Christ lives in me. And I am a ransomed one who knows the grace of God and therefore I'm extending the grace of God. And when you extend the grace of God, it brings favor to you. I think it's an awareness of your assurance, but then through you, of course, to others. So it becomes a witness to the believability of the gospel. This is not like other religions. This stands alone. Jesus Christ is different. God's love for you in Jesus Christ is different. He is not expecting a repayment. He is not looking at those who are worthy and saving them. We are not a group of the worthy. We are a group of the desperate. We are a group of beggars. And God has been stunningly gracious to us. This sets apart kingdom constituents from the world that we live in. And then he speaks the kingdoms, the, the reward of kingdom love. And here's how he kind of concludes this in verse 35. Number four, kingdom love's reward. Here's how he kind of draws the whole thing to a conclusion here. He repeats himself in verse 35. What I want to do here, because we've run through much of this already, I want to leave us with a few key understandings of how to make, how does this, how do we apply this? How do we live from this? How do we act in light of what we've seen here as we see this, you know? So let me, let me just walk through a couple points, I think, of application as I read verse 35. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the most high for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Okay, so how do we do this? How, how does this actually take place? Here's the first thing I want to say. Kingdom constituents, you and I, Christians, refuse to set the bar too low on your reward. You cannot set the bar too low on your reward. What do I mean by that? I mean, when you demand from others what you give, you've set the bar too low. When you live with a kind of love of reciprocity, you've set the bar of reward too low. What's your reward that you'd get back from another person? Guys, 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 we do not go for peanuts from people when we have riches from the Redeemer as the other option. And we, we live, get obsessed about peanuts from people. Let's go for riches from the Redeemer. Do you like the way I did that? A couple of smiles are going on there. But here's the thing. Now you'll think about it, won't you? And I'll be honest, this is a hard service to pay attention to. It's 8.30 on Daylight Savings Day. So you're welcome for a few alliterated points that are going to keep you on focus, all right? But let's settle for, that's what it is. That's what it is. We're going after peanuts from people and we get riches from the Redeemer. It's stupid. It's just stupid. Let's raise the bar on our reciprocity. Second thing, kingdom constituents, you must, 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 must live by faith, not by sight. You must live by faith and not by sight. You must live in a present, ongoing enjoyment and vision of God. Guys, you have to live with such an awareness of the promises that are yours because you're in the kingdom through, by grace through faith in Jesus that you see those future realities that are yours right now. You live as if kingdom realities that are future, consummately true in the future are yours now, presently. You have an intimate awareness of them. 
Because when you do that and you live by faith and you don't settle for peanuts when you could go for riches, what will happen is you'll be sons of the Most High. Now, don't read in your workspace theology to this. When you do all this stuff, you will become a son of God. This actually has nothing to do with God making you a son in that moment. This is actually assuming sonship before you even started any of these actions. When he says you will be sons of the Most High, he's not talking about what God's going to do as if that's the reward. He's talking about what men are going to think. There's no way to explain you except that you must be a son of the Most High. Why? Because you are being kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Huh, huh, huh. Just like your God is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. You're going to prove with your life that you are a son of the Most High, of the Sovereign One who pours out rain on the just and the unjust, does he not? And you're going to act like this and you're going to make this clear in your actions because your actions reveal your origins. And so, so therefore, you be merciful even as your Father is merciful. And guys, the, it's like only when you grasp the God of the Bible, only when you grasp the gospel will you have any chance of this. It's got to start by the God you believe in, right? So much of our actions reveal what we believe about God. So when the action is off, go back and say, do I know the God that I claim to be a follower of? Because when you grasp the God of the Bible and you let the God of the Bible and the theology of the God of the Bible inform your understanding of life and the world, you let the gospel inform your understanding, it is the only chance you will have at making this life your own. So one of the things is, and I love this, is that there are people coming to Christ all the time here, and I haven't said it as much as I want to, but if you're interested in exploring more about the good news of Jesus Christ, about him coming for you, living for you a perfect life, dying a death in your place for your sin to pay the penalty for your sin, rose on the third day conquering Satan's sin and death to ransom you out of the kingdom of darkness and bring you into eternal life with the Son in right relationship with the Father. We, we have a table out in the lobby called uh, the New Believers Table. Yes? New believers table is I'm like, ooh, better say it right. They're going to go out there and be like, that table's not there. <laughs> he must be tired as well. <laughs> the new believers table. And I would just encourage you to go talk to somebody there who would love to tell you about Jesus. Because one of the things that we, like I'm saying, the foundational thing you need to grasp is who God is. And what we see is even as we're struggling with this verse, can we just be honest? We butcher this. This is so hard. So can I just remind you that literally everything in here Jesus Christ fulfilled? He literally loved his enemies. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He gave his only son to die for enemies. You realize Jesus' cheek was assaulted, right? You realize his clothes were taken. You realize he was mocked and he was flogged and he was beaten, and he was nailed to a cross where he suffered this bloody death for sinners. And he didn't retaliate, but he prayed for those nailing him there. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's interesting because at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, it says you ought to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we just know we aren't. Right? Right? But Jesus came and he was perfect. He did this perfectly. And now he stands in our place. And he stands pleading our case and applying his work to our benefit. And he empowers us now who trust in him by faith alone so that not in our own strength, but we might by his spirit walk in the ways that he walked, and so model a kind of righteousness that surpasses even the scribes and the Pharisees. But this is impossible without the grace of the gospel. 
And it's impossible without being reminded of that grace as we come to the table, which we continue to be delighted that we can do again and again and again. We get to join at the table and celebrate the Lord, celebrate his death, celebrate his body nailed to a cross, celebrate his blood shed for sin, celebrate that we can have fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. Even enjoying this very meal together is a sign of that wonderful fellowship. It is a fellowship in the body and blood of Jesus. And so not only does Jesus want us to receive the word through the spoken word, but he wants us to receive the word through all of our senses so it would become very near in every way that Jesus Christ is our foundation, the grace of God in Jesus Christ crucified for sinners. And so we take this meal as a remembrance. We take this meal as a present participation in. We take this meal as a looking forward to that great meal that we will enjoy with the Lord when he returns. And so if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not in unrepentant sin, you are not in church discipline, then you are welcome to the table. And of course, for those who are, we would pray for restoration and repentance to rejoin the fellowship of believers. And if you are not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, let me just encourage you to go to the new believers table to walk through the gospel with some folks. And we pray, Lord willing, in time, you'll come having repented of your sin and placed your faith in Jesus to this table for communion. So I'm gonna go down church. You know how we're gonna do this. Come and grab the elements as I go down when you're ready after having examined yourself. And then Pastor Zach will lead us in the taking of that.